Uh, Franz Kramer will join us. So I thought, well, I should do this on how to, how to do things on a slope. I hope he still remembers. Uh, so again, with that, uh, really a true delight to have Bob. And uh, now we move to John Hunt. Hello, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Robert Bolde, Professor of Biochemistry, Molecular Biology, Ophthalmology, and Computer Sciences. University of British Columbia. He serves as Director of Center for Macular Research at UBC. Dr. Moldy received his Master's in Chemistry at Georgetown University, his PhD in, in Biochemistry at UPenn, and did a postdoctoral fellowship in chemistry, uh, postdoctoral fellowship at Caltech. He served on the editorial board, he has served on the editorial board of multiple journals, including scanning microscopy, experimental eye research, Journal of Biological Chemistry and Molecular Vision. He has been on many scientific, scientific advisory boards and committees, including Foundation Fighting Black Blindness, Macula Vision Research Foundation, and NEI Vision Research National Plan and Arbo Awards Committee. He has served as consultant for multiple companies, including Merck, Amgen, Biogen, and Novartis. He has multiple patents on poly polymer microspheres and particles for cell separation. He is notable for the development of 1D4 monoclonal antibody used widely for purification of rhodopsin and 1D4 TAC proteins. He has characterized peripheron to peripheron to ROM1 complex and ROM2 second disks. He has also characterized the CNG channel, retinoschisin, ABC4, and P4 ATPs. He has successfully developed gene therapeutic applications for restoration of photoreceptor function survival in RD3 mouse, a model of LCA12. As such, Moldy's research interests span wide, widely from membrane protein structure and fun function, phototransduction, gene therapy of inherited retinal degenerate, degenerative diseases, and phospholipid flippases. So without further ado, it is our pleasure to have Dr. Moldy present his talk for today. Okay, thank you very much for that kind uh, introduction. It's been really an honor to uh, participate in this excellent uh, seminar series. Uh, kind of would have preferred to be down there in person to see the beautiful campus in the uh, University of California, Irvine, but hopefully some other time. So let me start with a uh, statement that perhaps the most important molecule in vision is retinal. This, uh, luckily, this is a Zoom, so I don't have to look at the expression on people's face. But uh, as you know from the early work in George uh, Wall, that the first uh, important interaction of light is the uh, isomerization of levin cis retinal to all trans retinal within rhodopsin. This then activates uh, transducin PDE, uh, resulting in a decrease in cyclic GMP and the closing of cyclic GMP gated channels. So all these processes, as well as the um, restoration of the dark current, uh, are involved in uh, many proteins, which are involved in a whole series of retinal uh, degenerative diseases. And, including retinitis pigmentosa, uh, chromatoxia in uh, cones, uh, Leber's congenital amaurosis, as in the case of uh, guanolite cyclase, cone dystrophies, and so forth. So retinal is also important in the, in the visual cycle, which uh, is, involves both rods and cones. Here it just shows the conicanical uh, visual cycle in which uh, all trans retinal uh, produced from the uh, photo excitation of rhodopsin then is converted through a series of reactions involving both the photoreceptors and retinal pigment epithelial cells back to 11 cis retinal. So clearly there is a high flux of retinal through photoreceptor cells as well as the RPE cells. And although retinal is essential for vision, 
it's also a very toxic uh, molecule. And we can relate this for people outside the vision field with cholesterol, which cholesterol is essential for membranes and the synthesis of uh, steroids, but it also is toxic if not handled properly. In the case of retinol, it's usually either sequestered within a protein, as in the case of rhodopsin, or it's uh, quickly reduced to all trans uh, retinol as part of the visual cycle. However, retinol can also interact with amines, and this happens in the uh, disc membranes where phosphatidylethanolamine is around 38% of the total lipid. So a significant amount of all trans retinol um, reacts with uh, phosphatidylethanolamine to produce a compound which itself can be uh, toxic through side reactions and has to be processed then by a ABC transporter. So what I wanna deal with today is give a little bit of background on ABC transporters, uh, then discuss some of the earlier studies on the molecular characterization of ABCA4, and then go into some of our more recent work uh, over the past year on the high resolution structure of ABCA4 and some potential uh, uh, transport mechanisms of how the substrate gets uh, across the membrane, and then go into some molecular uh, mechanisms, other lying Stargardt's disease. And then I'll try to um, mention some of our future directions uh, towards therapeutic approaches uh, to uh, Stargardt's disease. So uh, what are ABC transporters? It's the super family of membrane proteins found in all organisms. And the human genome codes uh, 48 different uh, ABC transporters. E. coli has uh, 79, yeast uh, has only 28, but Drosophila is up to 51 and plants have well over 100. So it's quite a large family of membrane proteins, uh, which is of interest. <clears throat> so what do ABC transporters do? As the name suggests, they're ATP binding cassette uh, transporters in most cases that transport any of a wide variety of different uh, types of mo uh, molecules across the membrane. These can be lipids, uh, drugs, organic compounds, carbohydrates, ions, metabolites, and so forth. So it's a wide div diversity of different uh, com components. In the case of eukaryotic uh, ABC transporters, uh, these are mostly what's referred to as exporters. That means that they take a substrate from the cytoplasmic side of the membrane, and then through ATP binding, they flip uh, through what's referred to as an alternate access uh, mechanism and deposits the uh, substrate on the, uh, on the other side of the membrane. So these typical uh, ABC transporters have uh, a core domain of two transmembrane domains, TMD1 and TMD2, and two nucleotide binding domains which are involved in the binding and hydrolysis of ATP. The energy generated through binding and uh, hydrolysis of ATP then is used to fuel the um, transport of the uh, substrates across the membrane. And there's a lot of well-known ABC transporters. Um, perhaps the most well-studied is peak glycoprotein, which is a protein that gets upregulated when cancer patients uh, take drugs and then they become resistant to, to uh, drugs. Another uh, well-known uh, ABC transporter is uh, cystic fibrosis uh, transmembrane regulator, CFDR, which is involved in cystic fibrosis. This is actually a chloride channel, uh, but has the uh, architecture of an ABC transporter. And then there are many other ones which are involved in various types of inherited diseases. The one we'll be talking about today is called ABCA4, uh, previously known as the RIM protein and is involved in the transport of retinal derivatives. 
So ABCA4 is a member of the A subclass of uh, ABC transporters, of which there are 12 mem members. <laughs> and ABCA4 was the fourth one, which was cloned within this subfamily. So like other ABC transporters, it has the two transmembrane domains and two uh, nucleotide binding domains. But this whole class of A subunits also has these very large exocytoplasmic domains glycosylated on both the N-terminal half of the protein and the C-terminal half as shown here. So ABCA4 then exhibits a very high uh, degree of amino acid sequence identity to other ABC uh, transporters, uh, notably ABCA1, which is involved in the um, transport of uh, phosph phospholipids and uh, mediates the transport of cholesterol from cells, and ABCA7, which has been genetically linked to Alzheimer's disease. Uh, these are both exporters, where we will see that ABCA4 is an importer. So these are very similar molecules, and it's of interest to know why they differ in terms of their substrate specificity and their mechanism of transport. So ABCA transporter, uh, <coughs> ABCA4 was originally uh, first uh, detected in uh, frog rod outer segments by Dave Papermaster and colleagues back in 1978. And he was able to localize it along the rim regions of uh, outer segment disc membranes. Uh, so this uh, protein was generally termed as the RIM protein. It wasn't until 1997 that uh, this protein became interesting after the cloning of the, of the RIM protein. And so this just shows the localization of ABCA4 along the RIM and incisors of photoreceptor outer segments rods. And this is just immunofluorescence uh, uh, micrograph showing uh, ABCA4 primarily present in outer segments and some ABCA4 also present in the inner segment. At a higher resolution, one has immunogold labeling uh, showing the rim regions on each edge of the uh, outer segment and along the incisor. ABCA4 is also present in cone um, outer segments. We showed this uh, early on uh, by labeling a human foveal section where within the foveal it's pure cones and one can see the red labeling and in the flanking regions where you begin to get rod uh, expression, then we have a merged image of uh, rhodopsin in green and ABCR in red to produce a more yellow image. At a biochemical level, ABCA4 is a very large protein of uh, 2,273 amino acids in humans. And it can be visualized by uh, in purified outer segments as this high molecular weight protein of around 250. And this protein then can be readily purified by immunoaffinity methods from outer segments as shown here. So what, is the, what does ABCA4 do? Well, we in collaboration with uh, Yui Sung and Jeremy Nathans uh, purified ABCA4 and asked the question, what are the potential substrates for this protein? And previous studies with other ABC transporters showed that when you add the substrate, to these uh, ABC transporters, they activate the ATPase activity. So looking at a large number of potential molecules, the addition of retinal, either all trans retinal or 11 cis retinal to ABCA4 reconstituted into vesicles resulted in a dramatic increase in the ATPase activity, suggesting that retinal may be a substrate for ABCA4. However, we also know that all trans now, the aldehyde uh, reacts with amino groups to form the shift base 
uh, complex called N-retinylidine uh, phosphatidylethanolamine, or N-RET-DE for short. And our recent data suggests that a full bleach of outer segments, 50% is present in all trans retinal as a free retinal, and 50% is conjugated to uh, phosphatidylethanol to produce N-RET-DE. So we asked the question, what is the actual substrate? Is it retinal or N-retinylidine PE? So we let ABCA4 determine this by simply uh, conjugating ABCA4 to a uh, solid phase and then passing retinal in the presence of PE down the column and then analyzing what was bound. And this turned out to be N-retinalidine PE as analyzed by HPLC and spectroscopy. So the direction of transport was interesting because uh, general models suggested that it was actually an importer, not an exporter, but there was no experimental evidence for this. So we developed a uh, reconstitution system uh, to uh, monitor the direction of transport. In this system, we have what's called donor vesicles with ABCA4 reconstituted into these vesicles and acceptor vesicles with no transporter inside. So then upon the addition of ATP, then ABCA4 flips and retinylidine uh, PE from the inner leaflet to the outer leaflet where it can dissociate, leaving a higher concentration of retinal on the outer surface and a certain amount of retinal then will diffuse into the acceptor uh, vesicles. And this is just shown in this graph where upon the addition of ATP, one sees a large increase in um, uh, the transfer, transfer of uh, retinal from donor to acceptor vesicles. And this does not happen when you have an a, a, a ATP non-hydrolyzable derivative. So this is the general model then uh, where light interacts with rhodopsin uh, and ABCA4 uh, has two roles. One is, then is to flip any N-retinylidine PE, which is uh, in the uh, lumen leaflet of the uh, disc membrane to the uh, cytoplasmic leaflet where it then can dissociate and then the retinal can enter the visual cycle. ABCA4 also <laughs> takes care of any excess 11 cis retinal. So in the visual cycle, 11 cis retinal comes and occupies opsin to uh, regenerate rhodopsin, but any excess uh, 11 cis retinal will react with uh, PE and any of this that gets trapped on the lumen side then can be um, transported to the cytoplasmic side uh, using ATP as an energy source. And then a chemical isomerization then will result in, in the uh, trans uh, derivative of uh, NRET PE, which can then dissociate into PE and retinal and then re enter the visual cycle. So um, the pro the, uh, what was missing with all this is the high resolution structure of ABCA4 uh, because we wanted to uh, know whether the structure did agree with some of the previous biochemical studies uh, on the identification of the substrate and uh, transport across the membrane. We wanted to get some information on the possible mechanism of transport and its relation to other ABC. Uh, exporters, and <clears throat> also the structure can provide then important insight into the molecular mechanisms under, underlying Stargardt's disease. And finally, the structure of ABCA4 will be important in de developing novel therapeutic strategies uh, to prevent slower eliminate uh, Stargardt's disease. So in uh, 2017, Gong's uh, laboratory from China first published the high resolution structure of ABCA1 in cell. 
And <clears throat> this is basically what it looks like. And one can model ABCA4 based on ABCA1, but it was encouraging that you can determine the high resolution structure of this membrane protein by cryo electron microscopy. So uh, we were waiting uh, for the high resolution structure of ABCA4 to be determined by a uh, structural group. Uh, 2019 came along and we still had no structure of ABCA4. So a very talented uh, postdoc in my lab, Jessica Sertesi from uh, Brazil uh, joined my lab and we decided that we would give it a try uh, since it didn't look like anybody else was interested in determining the structure of ABCA4. So the uh, procedure that we used was uh, simply to uh, transfect um, <clears throat> cells with a plasmid which contains your human ABCA4 with a 1D4 tag, transfect cells uh, which are grown in uh, suspension, namely 293 cells, harvest the cells, solubilize the cells in mild detergent, do a simple centrifugation to remove any uh, material that hasn't been solubilized, and simply throw it through a row 1D4 amino affinity column to get a protein which is over 95% pure do a second step of size exclusion to remove any aggregates and any residual proteins. And then voila, you have the protein which you can study in detergent micelles or put back into nano disks. We use uh, primarily uh, the protein in detergent micelles since it has better access to uh, substrates. <clears throat> so here's a little bit of the data. Uh, this is the uh, Kamazi blue of your lysate from 293 cells expressing ABCA4. And you can see hundreds of different protein bands in this. After simple affinity purification, you can see a very pure ABCA4 protein with a few minor components, possibly chaperone proteins that may bind to a small fraction of a ABCA4. After uh, size exclusion chromatography, then you, we have a purified ABCA4. And one can look at the uh, homogeneity of the preparation by negative staining EM. And this is just an example of ABCA4, which is deposited onto uh, grids for electron microscopy. One also has to show that these, uh, the purified ABCA4 is functional, and we just show this again by ATPase activity and the activation of the activity by NRETDE. So <clears throat> once one has a preparation, then it's fairly straightforward to quick freeze it by plunging, uh, putting a little bit of the protein, a couple of microliters on a grid, plunging it in liquid ethane, uh, then imaging under high resolution cryo EM uh, to get two dimensional projections, which can then re be reconstructed into a, a 3D map. And from the three, 3D map, one can then generate a model based on the sequence of the protein. So we had all the facilities available at uh, UBC. I think we have three of them now, high resolution uh, cryo EMs. And we were then able to um, generate the high resolution structure of ABCA4. However, we were wrong in the sense that other groups were also interested in ABCA4 and we all published uh, the structure of ABCA4 uh, last year. One group is uh, Jeannie Chen's group from Rockefeller, who's uh, well known for determining the structure of CFDR and uh, Gong's group from uh, China, who uh, also had published previously the structure of ABCA1. But all structures uh, in different states uh, were all uh, essentially exactly the same, which was good news. So what does ABCA4 look like? It has these uh, domains, as we said before, the cytoplasmic domain, which can now be separated into the nucleotide binding domains. 
and at the very base are regulatory domains. Uh, at least they're called regulatory domains, whether they actually regulate or clamp the nucleotide binding domains together is unclear. Then your transmembrane domains. And this region then has pseudo twofold symmetry. But then in the uh, <coughs> exocytoplasmic domain, these uh, two uh, regions from the um, N half and C half of the molecule seem to intertwine each other and don't show any real um, twofold symmetry. Of interest then is the um, size of ABCA4. So in the lumen region of the disc, it goes uh, out from 100 to 120 angstroms. In the disc membrane, it's about 40 angstroms. And in the cytoplasmic region, it's 70 angstroms. Um, so this is interesting in relation to the size of the disc membranes with Chris's lab had uh, shown nicely uh, the various uh, dimensions. And so it's clear that this large extracellular or exocytoplasmic domain can only really fit in the rim regions of the disc membrane and cannot fit where rhodopsin is present, which is only 40 angstroms um, in, in uh, distance between the two leaflets of the uh, disc membrane. So we can look a little bit about the, at these uh, domains. Uh, perhaps the most interesting for us is the transmembrane domains. And one can see it has a V-shaped uh, uh, configuration, uh, which is referred often to an open outward conformation, <clears throat> where um, the uh, individual transmembrane segments of TMD1 and TMD2 seem to fold separately and are very highly in, in contact with the lipid bilayers. In one region, however, the, the uh, two transmembrane domains come together on the cytoplasmic side, and this is through transmembrane 5 in uh, TMD1 and transmembrane 11 uh, in transmembrane 2. Interestingly, within this gate is also lipid molecules, which plug the uh, gate and prevent anything from passing through. And one can see here in this electrostatic representation of ABCA4, the negatively charged phospholipid uh, head groups interact nicely with positively charged uh, residues in blue here, which are present on this uh, near the cytoplasmic leaflet of the membrane. So um, another interesting feature of uh, the transmembrane regions are these um, helical turn helical regions, regions of the uh, protein that only partially enter the uh, bilayer and then come back out of the bilayer as shown here in TMD1 and also found in TMD2. These kind of uh, structures are also found in ion channels where they serve as gates and uh, ion uh, filters. And so in the case of uh, ABCA4 or ABCA uh, subclass, uh, these are also present within the molecule. And this is just shown here in a cartoon of showing the helical regions, the alpha turn alpha region. Another interesting aspect then is the extracellular domain or the exocytoplasmic domain, which is highly glycosylated. And the structure did in fact identify the um, eight glycosylation sites, which uh, our lab and Chris's lab were, has shown by various methods, both site-directed site mutagenesis as well as uh, uh, proteomics as well as uh, a large number of disulfide bonds, which are uh, within the uh, exocytoplasmic uh, domains. And one uh, disulfide bond, which we showed earlier, likely existed between the ECD1 and ECD2. 
So what does this look on a structural basis? Well, as in the case of ABCA1, it can be decided, divided into three parts. The base that interacts with the transmembrane domains as shown here. Then a region which is referred to this as a tunnel, which in the top view has a very large um, groove or opening, some of which is uh, occupied by um, probably detergent. And then at the very top is referred to as a lid. This is a highly flexible region where one can't get very good uh, resolution as to what the actual structure is. And we were also show, able to show that this one disulfide bond between the ECD1 and ECD2 is in fact uh, easily represented within the structure. The uh, cytoplasmic domain is uh, not overly interesting in the sense that the nucleotide binding domains are very characteristic of the nucleotide binding domains that have been um, resolved in other ABC transporters and show the various motifs, Walker A and Walker B motifs, and in a head to tail configuration where one nucleotide binding uh, domain is opposite in uh, the tail region of the other nucleotide binding domains. They are reasonably close together as opposed to some of the other ABC transporters probably maintained in close contact with these uh, RD domains as shown here. The RD domains also contain this ACT domain, which is a beta, alpha, alpha, beta, alpha, beta structure as shown here. Uh, the ACT domain has been suggested in other proteins to bind small molecules and regulate uh, their activity. Whether this is the case with ABCA4 remains to be determined. Perhaps of more interest to us was uh, the, where the actual substrate binds. So we were able to uh, determine the structure of ABCA4 with its bound NRETPE. And just using spectroscopy, one can see the bound uh, N red PE as a nice peak at 367 uh, nanometers, as shown here, where ABCA4 in the absence shows no peak whatsoever. I draw your attention to the interesting um, <clears throat> properties of uh, N red PE, namely, they're extremely hydrophobic. This retinal group is extremely hydrophobic as are the fatty acyl chains of phosphatidylethanolamine. And this is then uh, interspersed with this highly charged, negatively uh, charged phosphate group and the polar uh, N nitrogen of the shift base. So somehow this structure has to fit in ABCA4. So we were able to determine it and Sure enough, n red PE was found on the intradiscal or lumen part of the ABCA4 sequestered between transmembrane one, uh, domain one and transmembrane domain two and capped with the uh, segments from the um, exocytoplasmic region. This just shows a uh, higher resolution area of surface uh, projection or representation showing how the uh, NRED DE is nicely sequestered within this uh, cavity within the protein. And it's highly uh, accessible to the uh, membrane, so it can easily diffuse from the intradiscal uh, leaflet to its binding site. One can look more uh, in more detail how this uh, substrate interacts with ABCA4 and of particular interest is the polar residues, the negatively charged phosphate and the nitrogen from the shift base. And these are bound through arginine residues, one in transmembrane two, which we had predicted to be in the binding site before the structure was determined. And this forms then an ionic interaction with the negatively charged phosphate and another arginine, which stems from ECD1, which forms again another ionic interaction 
with a phosphate as well as a hydrogen bonds to the nitrogen. However, other residues also contribute to the binding site, namely aromatic residues, um, <clears throat> in, including a uh, tryptophan at 339 coming from the B loop of the ECD uh, part of the molecule, tyrosine residues 340 and 345, and a phenylalanine uh, showing forming these hydrophobic interactions with the retinal group. There are also some uh, hydrophobic aliphatic groups, namely leucine and isoleucine groups, which extend off from transmembrane eight. The actual acyl groups, however, seem to be just floating there in this hydrophobic pocket, which is a good thing because uh, acyl groups uh, can have different sizes and different orientation. So it can accommodate uh, NREC PE with all different types of phosphate ethanol side chains. So uh, in summary then, uh, and red PE is um, sequestered in its binding site by, by both positively charged arginine residues and hydrophobic residues. So we were interested to know whether specific, uh, what importance specific amino acids play in the binding. So we did site-directed mutagenesis of a number of these uh, residues. Uh, and we focused on W339G, which is involved in Stargardt disease, uh, arginine 587 alanine, which we interact with the phosphate group and the, and, uh, and the nitrogen, and uh, the uh, tyrosine 345 and arginine 615. And when we did this, uh, we were able to get very good expression of all these wild type based expression as shown in this Kamazi blue uh, <clears throat> figure. And when we analyzed the ATPase activity, they all had very good basal activity uh, consistent with wild type, but they lacked their ability to be uh, activated by NREC PE. And this was true also for transport and also by simply uh, analyzing the binding of NRET PE, this was uh, binding was defest, deficient when any of these residues were uh, mutated to other residues. So all these residues appear to be very important in the specific binding of this residue. So the uh, structure of ABCA4 in the uh, ATP bound state has also been done it was first done by Chen's group. We also have a structure, although we haven't published it, but it's uh, again, identical. But what happens when you add ATP, then the ATP binds and the two uh, nucleotide binding domains then come in close interaction with each other. And this causes this massive conformational change for shown by Chris's uh, uh, lab at a lower resolution. But at a higher resolution, one can see you lose the gap, you lose the uh, binding site, collapses, and it forms this uh, very closed structure. And this is consistent with the idea that as soon as you add ATP, the NREC PE then um, no longer binds to ABCA4. Uh, again, the nucleotide binding domain is pretty similar to other ABC transporters where the ATP uh, bound with magnesium is present in both uh, nucleotide binding domains which come in close uh, proximity in a head to tail fashion in the dimeric type of configuration. So basically it suggests that in three states you have uh, ABCA4 in the APO state, uh, NRET PE in the uh, leaflet then is able to uh, diffuse to the binding site simply by that diffusion and the structure of ABCA4 in the substrate uh, bound state and its APO state are essentially identical with only minor changes within the uh, binding site. So it's really a pre-made uh, binding site for NRET PE. ATP then produces this significant 
uh, conformational change resulting in the movement of NREC to the other side of the membrane. So this produces a bit of a problem in terms of the mechanism of how NREC PE can actually move across the membrane through ABCA4. And one has to consider the amphipathic nature of the substrate, namely the polar residues don't want to be in contact with the hydrophobic region of the bilayer. Uh, you have a variable size and conformation of these fatty acyl chains. So you have to have a protein that can accept this kind of uh, diversity of acyl chains. And unlike virtually all other substrates, you have to actually change the orientation of the substrate 180 degrees because you want your polar uh, groups to be 180 degrees offset as you flip the uh, molecule from one side of the membrane to the other. So a, a decent model for that is what's known as a credit card model. And this is where um, when you uh, put your credit card into a machine and you have your either magnetic strip or your chip, it doesn't matter who's holding the card or anything along that line. The only thing that's important is the magnetic strip. And this is the same uh, kind of uh, situation you can uh, suggest for uh, lipid molecules where only the head group really interacts with the protein molecule and the fatty acyl chains and hydrophobic regions can extend out into the bilayer. So looking at ABCA4 structure, very interesting. There is a groove uh, through the transmembrane region, which is uh, produced by these uh, helical turn helical regions, EH3 and EH4, and transmembrane region 12. And interestingly, looking at the surface projections, uh, these are is a hydrophilic groove uh, with some positive and some negative charges. And we're suggesting that possibility that the actual molecule can maybe uh, be squeezed down this uh, pathway to the other side of the membrane as it's flipped from one side of the membrane to the other. So our current speculative model is just shown here where NRET PE diffuses to its binding site as shown by the structure. ATP comes along and produces probably a, a rigid body type of uh, conformational change, which uh, collapses the binding site, pushing the uh, substrate to the surface of uh, the NBD2, where the groove is. And then as the uh, protein uh, continues to close, it squeezes the uh, substrate down this groove to the other side of the membrane where positively charged groups then interact with the negatively charged uh, phosphate group to reorient the uh, lipid to 180 degrees. So this is in how a speculative model and eventually it would be nice to determine the structure in these uh, kind of transition states. Uh, however, this is more challenging. So let me now turn to Stargardt's disease. Uh, I think most people are probably familiar with Stargardt's disease, which was first described in 1909 by Carl Stargardt. It's an autosomal recessive disease with the prevalence now suggested to be somewhere around one in 6,500. So it's a reasonably uh, high incidence for a rare disease. Disease uh, typically occurs in the first or second uh, decade of life, but this can vary, and some individuals actually experience the disease in the fourth or fifth uh, decade of life. It's a progressive disease that uh, results in the loss in visual acuity in the initial phases of the disease, and this then can extend to the peripheral uh, vision in later stages of the disease, and it often has this characteristic uh, appearance of these flex in the para uh, uh, paramacular region, as shown here in this uh, fundus autofluorescence image. And in 1997, Alamets and his co-workers nicely showed that the um, gene uh, 
involved in Stargardt disease encoded in fact ABCA4 or the RIM protein. So what happens when you have a loss of function of ABCA4, you basically then <coughs> have an accumulation of NRETBE uh, on the lumen side of the membrane as shown here. This can then react with another retinal uh, group to form these bis uh, derivatives uh, as uh, shown by a number of laboratories. Uh, namely A2PE as an example, which form in photoreceptors. Then upon the um, phagocytosis of outer segments, the uh, uh, phosphatidyl group gets cleaved off and one has A2E. Uh, Janet Sparrow has shown also that there are many other bis retinoids that can also form when you have a loss of function of ABCA4. And so you then typically get these, the presence of the autofluorescent uh, flex, which uh, due to the accumulation of these bis retinoids, which are highly fluorescent. So uh, the genetic, geneticists uh, throughout the world and have analyzed various uh, mutations and virtually all the mutations in ABCA in other genes are shown also in ABCA4 including complex mutations involving several different uh, res, uh, nucleotide codons, uh, insertions and deletions, splice site mutations, frame shifts, non, uh, nonsense, and deep intron mutations. But most of the mutations are missense mutations, which uh, alter a single amino acids anywhere throughout the whole protein molecule. And this is just shown here in the topographical model, as well as in the uh, uh, high resolution structure. So the question then is, uh, what is the molecular mechanism underlying some of these missense mutations? And so um, uh, Fabian Garcia, a graduate student, and Laurie and Sue Curtis uh, all participated in generating a large number of these uh, disease-associated mutations. Uh, they were able to express these in transfected cells and then uh, measure the uh, ABCA4 expression uh, either by Western blots and its localization by immunofluorescence as well as purification to determine its uh, activity. And as shown here, one sees that the uh, mutations show a high range of different uh, levels of expression, some of them express it highly uh, at levels consistent with wild type. These then have a localization of this punctate uh, appearance, suggesting that the ABCA4 is exiting the ER and is being sequestered within uh, vesicles or uh, other structures within the cells. Other residue, other uh, changes produce very low expression, and typically these produce a reticular formation suggesting that these are misfolded uh, uh, mutants or variants which are retained in the endoplasmic reticulum by the quality control system of the cell. We then can look at the activity and many of the mutants show really almost no activity at all, very baseline, and no activation by NRETPE. And these are associated with also often with very low expression levels. And these typically are involved in severe global protein misfolding. A second class are more moderate where there is reduced expression. So there's probably some protein misfolding but there is some activity. The basal activity is typically lower than that found for wild type. And the activation does occur, but this is lower than that of the wild type. And then finally, we have the third class where these mutants, disease mutants uh, show expression and wild type activity um, as shown here. So the question is, do the, are these really uh, disease mutants? If one goes further and looks at the binding of NRETPE, in fact, these mutations show much lower binding of NRETP. 
PE suggesting that these work well at high retinal concentrations, but have a hard time really reducing uh, the NREP PE at much lower concentrations. So these produce a more mild phenotype. <clears throat> One can also suggest two other types of mechanisms. One, as we discussed previously, are mutations within the binding uh, site in which the uh, protein expression is normal and the basal activity is normal, but one has no activation of NREP PE. So these would be considered a quite severe mutations because of the lack of activity, uh, substrate activated activity. And then there's another class of uh, mutation within the nucleotide binding domain, which show wild type uh, expression, but show no activity whatsoever due to the fact that they have no, um, they are uh, defective in ATP hydrolysis, such as this uh, glutamate 1087 uh, aspartic uh, uh, AB, uh, Sargar disease mutant. So we asked the question, can you at all correlate the uh, expression and activity with the uh, severity of the disease? So we uh, <clears throat> developed this functional factor, which is essentially uh, the relative expression relative to wild type times the relative uh, activation by NRET BE. And we plotted the functional activity versus the age of onset for individuals who are homozygous for this given mutation. As shown here, the majority of the mutations are uh, occur at very early onset and considered to be very severe uh, disease. But some of the ones who do show some activity do uh, correlate reasonably well with the age of onset. So for example, the R210 7H has reasonable activity and has a very late onset. Um, and this particular mutant uh, has almost wild type activity, uh, but does show some um, disease uh, phenotype. <clears throat> we uh, also did this for uh, heterologous individuals, which uh, have a trans uh, variant, which has no function, such as a a null allele. And again, we get some kind of correlation, not perfect by any means, uh, but there is some correlation. So the difficulty here from the clinical side is that often there's only a few Sargars patients that one can deal with, and often the age of onset is not well documented. At the genetic side, we may also have some genetic modifiers or socio environmental factors we, which may contribute also to the onset. And the biochemical side, we're only looking at really two parameters, uh, ex expression and, um, and red activation activity. But really, we should also consider other parameters such as the affinity of ABCA4 for substrate. And this, for example, would bring down uh, this particular mutant probably down closer to uh, a better correlation. Okay, so let me just finish up with where we are going or where we hope to go with very limited data. And this is therapeutics. So as uh, one knows, there's many different types of uh, <clears throat> therapeutic approaches being uh, carried out for Sargars disease. These include drug therapy, gene therapy, neuroprotective approaches, uh, nutrients and stem cell technology among others. However, at present, there's no real effective uh, therapies for this disease, although some are in clinical trials. So a number of labs have concentrated on the visual cycle with the <clears throat> just premise that if you do reduce right now, you'll reduce the production of these bis retinoids, which are suggested to be the cause of uh, Sargard disease and various types of drug inhibitors uh, inhibit various uh, uh, enzymes in the visual cascade system as shown here. Uh, a particularly promising one is a deuterated uh, vitamin A derivative, which uh, is also show, 
has shown to limit the production of A2E. However, our approach was really to um, use either personalized or precision uh, approaches uh, for drug therapy. And that's generally involves identification of compounds that can enhance the activity of ABCA4 through improved protein folding or enhanced functional activity. The paradigm here is Vertex uh, Pharmaceutical Company, which has identified compounds which target uh, cystic fibrosis transregulator or cystic fibrosis, uh, as we mentioned before, another member of the ABC transporter. And these are basically corrector drugs that enhance the protein folding and trafficking of uh, CFTR to the cell surface and another group of uh, drugs which are potentiators that enhance the activity of CFTR. And such drugs are, have passed through uh, clinical trials and are now used in combination to uh, quite nicely affect uh, or uh, uh, help uh, individual with uh, certain forms of cystic fibrosis. So our current strategy then is to apply this uh, drugs uh, to ABCA4 missense variants through drug screening using uh, to identify pharmacological agents which can target specific ABCA variants to correct either protein folding or enhance the functional activity. Once we have drugs that do bind, we can use cryo-EM electron microscopy with, to identify the binding site for the specific drug. Once we have this information, then we can use computer-assisted drug design, namely artificial intelligence, to identify structures, improve structures, and a new generation of drugs. These then can be designed and then further evaluated with the hope then that we can go eventually to preclinical uh, tests on animal models and eventually clinical trials. So as I say, uh, uh, COVID has limited our uh, studies, but we do have a couple of drugs that enhance the folding of one mutant uh, for Stargar disease, uh, arginine 1108 uh, cysteine, uh, showing an enhancement of expression of uh, anywhere from 1.2 to uh, close to 1.8 uh, over the, over the uh, mutant, which has no drug whatsoever. So we have to still push on uh, uh, with this kind of methodology. The other area that we're investigating are referred to as DNA based editors. Uh, so our view is to encapsulate the RNA of these base editors that can change a specific uh, nucleotide, which has, is uh, defective in um, a given missense mutation. Uh, these can be then encapsulated into lipid nanoparticles uh, and our colleague uh, has a laboratory adjacent to ours, Peter Cullis. Um, maybe most of you haven't uh, heard of Peter Cullis, but are affected by his uh, research as he's the one who designed the lipid particles that encapsulate RNA in the Pfizer vaccine for COVID. So if you've had a jab of uh, the Pfizer vaccine, these are the lipid particles which encapsulate the RNA or the vaccine. So we're hoping to use this type of technology uh, then to transpect photoreceptors in mice and, and uh, harboring a, a specific disease mutation and then look for rescue. The other area would be to use these virus-like particles that uh, David Liu and, uh, has developed recently and are, look quite impressive and can also be used to encapsulate either RNA uh, or protein and be also used in conjunction with base editors. So we don't have any data for this. Uh, so this is uh, currently uh, on uh, being carried out. So uh, because of the time, I won't go into the uh, conclusions, but basically it just acknowledged the people in our laboratory, our current members, uh, uh, as shown here, some of the race, recent members who 
been instrumental in some of the work I just talked, as well as uh, previous laboratory members. We also had collaboration with Philip Van Pettigan, who's a structural biologist uh, and works on ion channels. And he has uh, made sure we were on the right track with ABCA uh, for structure and function, and then some other projects and the present grants and, and resource facilities for these uh, uh, projects. Uh, thank you very much then for uh, uh, listening and I'm happy to answer any questions. This was a wonderful story and I have so many questions, but I maybe limit myself to about 20 and then we ask other people to ask, or maybe less than 20. <laughs> so uh, you mentioned about uh, retinal that uh, it establishes equilibrium after breaching about 50% is as a PE and 50% as a free retinal, right? That's what right. you have so right. is this because of the hydrolysis of shift base and you just simply establishing the equilibrium at that level 50 50 uh, or, or there is other reason why it, you know there's much more pe present so it should be uh, stuck up completely the retinal yeah we've uh, done a fairly systematic study with model systems uh where we um can show that there is a dependence of uh, the concentration of PE in, in vesicles, which are produced, can be produced at different uh, concentrations of PE. So it, it is an equilibrium process and the 50% is uh, total amount of um, NRET PE just after leaching. So probably half of that may be on the cytoplasmic side and the other half would be on the movement side. And I think this equilibrium is very important because ABCA4 itself is not a, that active a protein. So a lot of the uh, release of right now is still probably through mass action. And so um, one has to do more, but it's quite uh, interesting that so much of the right now release from redoption quickly does uh, uh, react with PE. So the, the second question, uh, quickly, to RPE expression of ABC4, what are your thoughts about uh, that and the function, if, if any? Of, of what expression? Of, of ABC4 expression in RPE. Oh, um, yeah, well, uh, I guess if one ever looks for ABC4 expression without putting a lot of emphasis, you don't see it because it's only like 1% of what's present in, um, in photoreceptors. But uh, if you've done like uh, Redu did and do a very systematic uh, analysis, then there's probably very small amounts are present. Uh, and they may function uh, either because right now can diffuse into RPE cells and you will react to some degree with um, PE and has to be flipped or coming from um, the phagocytosis of uh, outer segments. So I think it's there. Do I think it's extremely important? Probably not. So I think if you were targeting just photoreceptors with therapeutics, I, my hope would be that most of the uh, problem would be solved as opposed to having to worry about the small amounts in RPE. Okay. But of course I could be wrong. <laughs> Yeah, hi, uh, Bob. Uh, wonderful, very thorough and and sort of complete talk. And and uh, you know, some of us who don't follow the field as much as uh, many others, I think, learned a lot. I, you know, I'm curious uh, from a genetics perspective. Um, uh, you know, I'm I'm never satisfied by using in vitro assays to define genotype phenotype. Uh, I mean, to some extent that. I think holds, but maybe not as much. I'm more curious about your structural analysis. I was wondering, based on your uh, based on your uh, you know cryo EM structure, can you predict uh, uh, that you know can you predict whether certain mutations will give more severe phenotype than what 
has been seen in ABCR or ABCF for knockout mice, or maybe in another way, um, can you look at uh, variants that people predict are associated with AMD, at least with all this thing going on? Um, do you think some of those variants associated with AMD, um, you know, based on your structure, how they could impact function and can you make some predictions based on your structure? I'm very curious about that. Uh, well, you can begin to make some predictions knowing exactly where the mutation is and, and what functional domains of the protein. Um, you can look to see what residues are critical for certain hydrogen bonding and other types of interactions. And you can uh, you know, suggest uh, that they could be very um, severe. Um, in terms of AMD, I don't really think uh, Stargardt's disease is really linked to AMD. There's late forms of Stargardt's disease, um, but it is a, typically an autosomal recessive disease. So I guess maybe heterozygous could have something which looks like AMD uh, very late on. But you know, this is a fairly controversial area. I'm not a geneticist, <laughs> so um, I think it's uh, uh, you know can be separated uh, Sargar's disease from uh, AMD. Uh, but yeah, I think the structure will start producing very important results as to how these uh, specific missense mutations affect the structure. Do they cause more severe disease phenotype than a null? I don't think so. I don't think there's uh, any evidence yet to suggest that there's really that much stress on photoreceptor cells for a misfolded protein, but uh, it's possible that there could be very small effects. But typically, the severe mutations look very much like uh, null alleles, i.e., they have no functional activity and don't really uh, cause much additional effect on photoreceptors. Thank you. So let's go to Marco. Hello, Prof. Mulday. Thank you very much for uh, the presentation. It was fantastic. I have a question about uh, the production on AB, uh, ABCA4 uh, prior crystallization. So basically, uh, you show that you use Excels. And I just I wanted to know if before moving to Excels, you tried the expression in bacteria and in set cells. Uh how, how do we uh, measure this? How do we do the expression? Uh, if you try to produce the protein in bacteria and in insect cells before moving to excess, or you went straight for excess? Um, Would you I'm try to sure. express in bacteria, Bob? Oh, no, no. We, we don't bother uh, expressing proteins in bacteria. The uh, lipids are so much different that uh, you just don't get... Uh, any decent expression, and even in yeast, I think it's uh, I, I think it's the wrong route to go. I think you really want to express it in uh, mammalian cells or whatever your membrane protein is. Uh, that may, of course, not be true for domains or for uh, soluble proteins, but except for some rare exceptions, most of the mammalian proteins just don't express well in bacteria. Uh, yeast is another system, as is insect cells. We find that uh, two, nine, three cells in suspension are really an excellent source uh, that can be used to generate uh, milligram quantities of uh, protein, which is more than enough to do cryo EM in different states. Dominique. Uh, Dr. Molde, great talk. Thank you. <clears throat> I have a couple of questions regarding the extracellular domain. <clears throat> Do you know um, if the uh, glycosylation, what is this role of the glycosylation sites or the glycosylations? And do we know if the uh, mutations in glycosylation sites cause any, cause, uh, any phenotype, any disease? And, uh, and also one more question uh, regarding the um, lead. Uh, from the extracellular domain, is it in intrinsically disordered and it's getting uh, ordered and structured upon uh, closing or, or not? 
Well, in terms of glycosylation sites, uh, yeah, there are many mutations which uh, uh, prevent glycosylation and then are also involved in Stargardt's disease. So I think the glycosylation sites are important. We did an early study of mutating them. And as you mutate them off, you get less expression. Uh, presumably the protein is less stable and uh, doesn't insert as well. And that would be also true for the um, disulfide bonds. So the question with extracellular region, why, why do you have such a big extracellular region is, is really a perplexing uh, question. In the case of ABCA1, it's suggested to serve as a conduit for the movement of lipid molecules from the um, membrane to the uh, APOA1. So the lipid molecules could actually move through this uh, tunnel there and uh, access the APOA1. In the case of ABCA4, there's really not much in the uh, lumen of the disc. So it may be simply mainly a structural uh, uh, domain, although, you know, more, more studies have been, are required and it's possible that it could also bind retinal or some other derivative, uh, which may play an important role in the regulation of the protein. But, you know, these are questions that, you know, have to be eventually answered. Dorota. Hi, uh, this is Dorota skowalska krawczyk from uh, CityVR here. It was a fantastic talk. Thank you for clarifying so many things for me. Um, I um, I was um, struck by the um, how big um, structural change, uh, substantial structural conformation change has to happen for um, this uh, model and even for the credit card model, right? Uh, it has to be like a whole turn but or half turn. Um, but we know that the lipid surroundings of ABCA4 is at least on the fatty acids level pretty rigid. And uh, I wonder what you think about it and um, how, how do you, oh, my, my actually man, major question is whether you have tried some of those mutations um, uh, in the native somewhat lipid surroundings to see whether it will change their activity compared to the micelle myself's uh, activity? Uh, yeah, that's uh, definitely an interesting question. Uh, uh, of particular interest in is this binding site of uh, the lipid in uh, the cytoplasmic region. And that's those lipids are present in all ABCA structures uh, found to date. And that has caused problems with some people who try to purify the protein in the absence of lipid. So those lipids are quite critical and uh, some of the residues that interact with that lipid uh, when mutated do also call Stargardt's disease. In terms of the surrounding part of the protein molecule, yeah, we've done the structure in, in detergents. So you have a, um, a detergent wrapped around the transmembrane region. Uh, some structures have been coming out of ABCA7, I think in uh, lipid nanoparticles where you do have the bilayer and more ordered lipids, but the structures seem to be pretty similar. Uh, so I think basically that the protein really has to be interacting with a hydrophobic environment to um, generate its proper structure, whether that's through detergent molecules or through the lipid bilayer, I think in both cases, they are producing um, structures that are uh, pretty close to native. Rafa. Hi, Dr. Molde. Thank you for the inspiring talk. Uh, my question is somewhat related to Dorota's question, I think, but uh, more on the molecular level. I was wondering if you have any insight if the lipid acyl chain composition of phosphatidylatonolamine would affect the rate of transport of uh, N-retinylidine across the, the lipid bilayer? Yeah, that's, um, that's a good question. Uh, we did show early on that uh, you could use different uh, uh, 
phospho phosphatidylethanolamines with uh, the DHA uh, side uh, ACL groups much longer and much more unsaturated in place of uh, we use typically uh, diolio uh, fatty ACL groups. And in both cases, they did activate the activity to a similar extent. So I think the fatty ACL groups could have um, some effect on the uh, rate at which it does uh, transport. Uh, the model would suggest that most of the ACL groups would be out in the bilayer, so may have only a minor effect on the rate and uh, the ability of the uh, substrate to bind to the uh, ABCA4. But clearly, uh, it would be of interest perhaps to uh, determine the structure with uh, a uh, substrate that has uh, a much longer fatty ACL chain and more uh, unsaturated to see if you know that affects either this uh, how it's organized within the uh, binding site and uh, if one could do kinetics of actual transport whether it affects that too it possibly it could all right so we had a wonderful conversation uh, last three questions Rada Philip and John okay <laughs> thank you Chris <clears throat> it's a wonderful talk, uh, Bob, really enjoyed. I have a question which is somewhat related to Anand's comment. Uh, <clears throat> so like, you know, if you have shown elegantly like uh, the formation of this misfolded protein aggregates. So which is the basis for the essay. Um, so we also like, you know, um, the same thing was also observed in other cases, other misfolded proteins. Uh, again, your lab showed very nicely the ELOVL for misfolded protein forming these aggregates. And um, also my lab did the same. And uh, with reference to P23H, so that's, that's one of the things early established the formation of this misfolded proteins and formation of aggregates. But however, have you seen this in vivo? Because these are we all we have seen this in a um, you know cell culture, mainly the cos cells and other cells. So have you observed this in any of the in vivo models? How do we process what? Have you not? Have you observed the formation of these misfolded protein aggregates in vivo? Uh no, we haven't. We haven't uh, done any of that. That work. You think it's important to do that? So, in case of P23H, which is a very well studied model, and uh, you know they have shown the formation of the same misfolded protein aggregates, but I have not observed anybody demonstrating it in vivo because that's a very well studied model. I am wondering whether you have any thoughts on why, and. Uh, uh, because in case of ELOVL4, you know, you have shown that in uh, um, cell culture and we did the same. And we, when we tested in the mouse model, we did not see that. And uh, um, I had a few discussions with people on P23H and they said they have not seen, but at the same time, I, you know, I, I didn't have, you know, detailed understanding of what they have done. So that's why I'm asking. Yeah, I mean, we, we've we only looked at one model, which was the N965S uh, for ABCA4. And what we observed really was that uh, there was an accumulation of ABCA4 in the inner segment, presumably to, to a high degree in the uh, ER, but we didn't really uh, observe any um, aggregates. And we don't really see aggregates per se in 293 cells or cos cells, we sort of see sort of this reticular distribution as if the protein is there, but it um, could be partially aggregated, but not visually uh, detected by fluorescence microscopy. But then the other fact, uh, yeah, I think your point is well taken that sometimes you see things in uh, cultured cells, which are not truly found in, uh, in vivo, possibly due to the different ways that specific cells uh, handle these misfolded proteins. Okay. 
Hey, Dr. Molde. Oh, sorry. Uh, really, really nice talk. I mean, I, just to reiterate, it's very inspiring for me, you know, as a, somebody who, who likes to link molecular studies to translational science, it was really, really, uh, you know, inspiring talk. So thank you very much and congratulations on, on uh, determining the ABC4 structure. So my question kind of already got asked, but it, regarding the extracellular domain, but I was wondering, I mean, one of the things that having these high resolution structures could enable you to do is, for example, design rationally uh, chimeras and, you know, it might enable a study of really the role of that extracellular domain, either in binding things or trafficking or so on. So it's just a thought I had that I thought I'd share with you. But again, very nice work. Thanks for presenting. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, we do have some ideas on how to get ABCA4 to the cell surface by doing various types of chimeras and uh, by doing some mutations in the extracellular domain. So yeah, those are kind of interesting questions and on, ongoing work in our lab. Thank you very yeah. much for the question. Yes, uh, hello, great talk. I, I really love um, learning a, a lot about ABC4 and its mechanism was very, very fascinating to, to learn about. Uh, one question I had was going back to the first question, um, about the reversibility of the hydrolysis and then followed by also the condensation of the shift phase being a reversible reaction. Uh, with regards to this, the retinal can feasibly maybe traverse the bilayer from inner and outer leaf without having, without necessarily requiring ABC4 or perhaps the retinal is once it once it establishes a side in the inner versus outer leaflet, perhaps it stays in one side. Uh, if if it if right now is freely moving from inner and outer leaflet via just um, diffusion and um, kinetics of cond condensation and reverse uh, reverse reversible hydrolysis, where do you think the role of ABC four is in the disease of uh, of Starkart disease? Yeah, uh, obviously a very good question. And that was the whole question that arose when ABCA4 was first uh, identified and uh, shown to involve uh, the transport of retinal. Um, why do you need it? Because uh, retinal itself is uh, very hydrophobic and can move back and forth. And I think that does happen in, in photoreceptor cells. But since it's an equilibrium, you're always going to have some uh, and retinal PE there, unless it's actively removed uh, from the lumen side. So it's probably in part a kinetic issue. And so if you don't have any ABCA4 around, there always will be some residual N ret PE uh, sequestered in the lumen. And so I believe the real function of ABCA4 is to make sure you really clear all the retinal so you don't have get these uh, side reactions. So it really is a combination of uh, mass action uh, reversibility, uh, which is very critical, but also the fact that uh, even small amounts of NRET PE, which um, <clears throat> will be retained without ABCA4 can eventually lead to um, the disease. So nature probably put in ABCA4 to really make sure that all the retinal is uh, removed because of its potential toxic effects, not only in the outer segment, but ability to diffuse to the inner segment and to other cells, which then can cause all kinds of um, cell degeneration. All right, uh, let's move to the final comments from my favorite, Roxana. <laughs> Hi there. Uh, 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 thank you very much, Chris, and uh, um, really outstanding presentation. I really enjoyed that. And uh, thank you, Chris, for asking that question regarding ABCA4 in the RPE. Yeah, it turned out that many people who actually study RPE actually identify the presence of the ABCA4 in the RPE. And for us, or at least for me, the question, uh, you know, that raised what ABCA4 does in the RPE came from, you know, very naive, uh, you know, approach. 
phagocytosis. So phagocytosis happen every single day. So that brings into the RPE, not just lipid proteins, rhodopsin, visual pigments. Those visual pigments consist of opsin or conopsin bound to retinaldehyde. In a dark adaptive state, that will be primarily 11 cis retinaldehyde. But we all know that once the protein degrades, it will release that pool of free retinaldehyde. So that goes to you where the free aldehyde comes in the RP. That's what we talk about, like ABC4 expressing the uh, membrane, internal intracellular membrane of the RPE will facilitate recycling of this free retinaldehyde that's being released following the visual pigment uh, uh, degradation in the endolysosoma. And that's not uh, insignificant because 10% of the total amount of the retinoid content, ocular retinoid content, it's significant. Those are about 50 picomoles of retinaldehyde releasing the RPE. So what does happen with that? So, and that's how, you know, kind of uh, we describe the mechanism of the ABCA4 working in the RPE. It's the same, it binds to PEs in internal membrane and it flips in the same way that it would do in the disc membrane of the photoreceptors. So that was the comment. And yes, indeed, it's very low abundant compared to the photoreceptor expression, but I definitely think it has tremendous significance when it comes to aldehydes recycling or detoxifying in the RPE. All right, thank you very much, everybody. We have a lot thank of things you. to do. Great job.